so yes, colonialism. So anybody have any understanding, knowledge, or what they know about how colonialism works in the world? Um, I'm actually Native American too. Um, from, I'm from the Mokmaloni tribe, which is like Aboriginal to the Bay Area. So yeah, I know like like colonialism and its effects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I was having this conversation with my mother the other day, and you know, I was very surprised that you know, I'm I'm this mixed race person. You know, I'm bilingual. I have Latin on my father's side. Uh, my mother, she has Asian and Native American on her side, and so you know, we were just having this very huge conversation about my some of my ancestors who were brought over here through chattel slavery and they they were in the South Americas and in the Caribbean and how they made their way to the south of um, um, Georgia and Alabama and then they moved their way to the Midwest and that whole conversation was just like wow and so I didn't know at one time because you know I'm not from here so at one time my grandmother used to live in California so I didn't know that so it's like I'm following in my grandmother's footsteps and also too when I was younger I was also you know I grew up in Kansas City but my family has a national reserve well not a national well I, I guess you can call it it's a reservation um, and so many people think that the reservations are just solely for Native Americans so um, my father's side of, again has similar ancestry to like maybe Shakira where it's like you know, Arab, Spanish, you know, African. I have the same kind of like, you know, things happening on my father's side. And so it was just really interesting, you know, um, just to hear those stories. And so like, yeah, I think it's, it's it works in a lot of ways, colonialism, um, sometimes good where it brings different ethnicities together. Um, it sometimes can displace ethnicities together that work together. Um, that have, you know, um, mutual um, needs, you know, sometimes tribes and ethnic groups work individually, but sometimes they need each other for different resources, whether it's goods and or services. So yeah, I definitely agree with you, Isabella. And also too, I, I like, that's why I think I like the rights of nature affirmative, because I think there's a critique in there that could be made, because it talks a lot about Indigenous folks and stuff like that and guardians and when it's talking about legal guardians those legal guardians that they're talking about specifically in terms of what they mean by legal guardians are people on reservations because they legally are defined as being reserved by the government to be protected and they're not so, some general information about colonialism is in this slide and i found it online so hopefully i can so colonialism the definition, somebody want to read it? Uh, settlers who came, uh, arrived as permanent mi migrants for indigenous peoples in these places, this meant a different kind of experience with colonialism and different possibilities for decolonization. So yes, so when there's moments of colonialism happening, there's also moments of decolonization to be occurred. So, um, you know, there's this statement, well, I, I don't know if I created it, but I used to always make this argument a lot that just as much racism that there is, is just as much counter racism you need, right? And so I think that's what it's attesting to. Um, and so when people make arguments about like, oh, your criticism is not enough or your critique is not enough, it's like, no, my critique is just the starting point of the revolution or not even just revolution or whatever you may, whatever you're trying to challenge, right? Um, it don't have to be a revolution. It, it don't have to be, it could be Gandhi's philosophies. It could be nihilism, whatever your alternative is, um, is how sometimes you can, you can do your alternative is just, just as much as the status quo. Okay. So, um, Settler colonialism, I think, is also different because it, it goes to a different area. It's not about just like, you know, I'm just here for a second. It's like, no, they settle and they immerse within the area. They want indigenous lands, not indigenous people. So they're there to extract a lot of the, you know, raw goods, um, re, you know, resources from the land. 
pet, you know, fish, um, food sources, water, hence why we have the rights of nature affirmative. Um, a lot of times this um, ends up happening because they need to displace, because they want to take control of the land, they have to take control of the people. So hence, you know, chattel slavery, people exploiting people. You, you, and a lot of times in order for you to exploit the land, you have to exploit its people that are not necessarily own the land because a lot of times these set, the people who are indigenous to the land don't believe that they own the land, but you know, they're natural inhabitants of the land. And so those natural inhabitants of the land or native inhabitants of the land, um, they get pushed out, crowded out. Um, and then, you know, once the, the cultural, the, once the people leave, the culture leaves and, you know, their way of lawmaking leaves, right? And, and implementing policies that all also gets altered, right? Hey, I'm kind of teaching you about critiques too at the same time. Look at God. Somebody want to read this? Isabella, you want to read this? Um, decolonization is further fraught because although the settler native slave trade structures settler colonialism, this does not mean that settler native and slave are analogs that can be used to describe corresponding identities, structural locations, worldviews, and behaviors, nor do they mutually constitute one another. For example, indigenous is an identity independent of the trade and also ascribes structural location within trade. Chattel slavery is an ascribed structural position, but not an identity. Settler describes a set of behaviors as well as structural location, but is skewed as an identity. Yuck, man. 2012, page seven. Oh, man, this is a really good, man. If I had this card back today, I would be messing people up. I can't even say it because I know I'm recording. But yes. Um, and I just want to uh, just correct you really quickly. Not that it's a big thing, but it's the word is triad or triad. That's how it's pronounced. Um, but yeah, so this card is talking about decolonization. Decolonization is just to basically to it's basically saying to break down colonialism from being as strong as it is. Um, and it's talking about like our understanding. Do you know what this top part is talking about? What's this this part from behaviors to decolonization? Does anybody understand what the what the person is saying here, Tuck and Yang? And I think Yang is, I think I've read Yang before. Anyways, because it's George and, no, that's Yancey, excuse me. Sorry. Anyways, um, maybe I have read Yang before. Anyways, because I feel like I've, said, I've seen that name. But no, um, so from here to behaviors, anybody understands what, they're, what this person is saying? So basically, there, there's this thing that happens, right? And I'm thinking it's, it's getting to into the the way. The, I'm not even gonna say waves, but critiques come in layers or in waves, as you know. I've said to you before, Sam, and there's layers to this. So colonialism has its has its layer. Then you have neo-colonialism, which has its layer. Then you have um settler colonialism which has its layer then you have neo-settler colonialism which has its layer right so you have these layers of of understanding not just not just about how colonialism works but also about how the people relate to that colonialism right and so sometimes through a, a description of colonialism you know, there still is some conversation that structurally binds you to that still pervasive conversation of being tied to, as they're saying here in that settler native slave triad. So it's kind of like a way of codifying, codifying you. That's actually the philosophical term, C-O-D-I-F-Y-I-N-G, -C -O -D codifying. Um, when you codify something, um, you kind of lock it in this place of understanding. And, and, and it's kind of like when you put labels onto something. Um, so that's what that this particular author is talking about, that, that your understanding of what it means to be a slave 
what it means to be a settler creates that understanding and the worldviews that necess that necessitates the behavior of settler colonialism. Do you understand me now? Yes, no. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I, 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 my, I minimize my screen so I can't see if anybody was shaking their heads or anything. So get out of my business. Hold on, go back. Where are we at? Oh, Lord. Here we are. Okay. So that's that guy. All right. So what does settler colonialism want? This is a very effed up question. <laughs> So it comes in terms of and is destroying indigenous peoples, it turns child slaves into property by destroying their humanity um, and defining them as slaves. Be it so it destroys to replace. It is about the land who belongs and who deserves to be here. Hence why you see a lot of Karens walking up to black people asking us, why are you here at this barbecue, ma'am? <laughs> Ask your people why I'm here. <laughs> Ask your grandfather. <laughs> How about that? Get up on my face. <laughs> but yeah, that's why you have situations like that. Um, but how does settler colonialism get what it wants? It is a system, it is pervasive. That's the word I used to use a lot in, de in debate is the pervasiveness about it. Some people used to be like, well, how am I supposed to be? How am I, it's like, you know, I don't know. Some people, I don't know, I know it's kind of hard. How do you deny, how do you debate against racism? Here is not debating, about racism necessarily, but it's trying to, again, debunk understandings. And that's what you should be doing throughout the debate. The debate is debunking the understandings of, again, how do we create that triad of codifying? And th that's how you create your link scenarios in the debate. And again, um, it's talking about how it denies exist existence. That denying of existence creates an erasure, right? It, it creates an erasure, an erasure of people, right? A lot of times, if you look at federal law, since we're talking about the United States federal government and what it should be doing, if you want to look at this from the negative side, because you can, you could also run settler colonialism on the affirmative side. We'll talk about that later. But um, if you're looking at the settler colonialism on the um, negative side, how many times have you seen federal government policies include indigenous folks, right? Like even me as a black person who has indigenous ancestry, like there's probably more federal law for my like black blood because you know, and for some reason in American history, that one drop makes you all the way black. So, you know, um, that's what they say. I didn't write the rules, but you know, th um, there's these understandings again that codify us, right? It continues to, I says here too, well, I just, crazy <laughs> i didn't i look i really didn't even think about it but that's what it says it denies the long impacts of slavery it continues to depossess indigenous people and black peoples which is true it promotes white supremacy which is also true right it, again it's about the pervasiveness of whiteness right whiteness works in a circle sometimes and that's why it's sometimes and that's why you should be careful when you run these arguments because you yourself can create opportunities where the critique you run the critique or like i said how my representation of this slideshow is a deserves a critique within itself again yes sometimes you have to be careful how you're um performing your criticism understanding so it helps us understand about racism and how to you know um counter it and challenge it Settler, like, again, settler colonialism um, covers its tracks. Again, it's like when Karen, you know, asks you why you're here, and then she slaps you and then falls on the floor and says, oh, my gosh, call the police right now. It's the same thing. <laughs> um, it doesn't want to take responsibility, right? It's not going to take responsibility because it benefits from the land, right? So it's not going to take settler, settler colonialism is not going to take responsibility. You know, and you know, again, it's again, that's why I mean, um, there needs to be for ex from the indigenous folks side, I'm, I'm not gonna just say indigenous folks side because there's so many people around the world. There's oriental, I don't, I don't even think that's the right word to say, Asian, Asian philosophy, 
East, West, there's East and West Asia philosophy. Look, I can say these things because I'm everything. So I can, look, I'm the mutt that gets to make all the, the, the incorrect titlements here, okay? Only me. <laughs> Even the other word that we're not going to say. All those things I can say, okay? Some people cannot, but that's not the point here. What I'm trying to say is that um, there's other people in the diaspora or in the pan-Africanism or in the pan-understanding um, of what it means to be indigenous because you have indigenous folks in Chile, you have indigenous folks in Mexico, Guatemala, um, Peru, all the way to Brazil, all the way to Nova Scotia, Canada. There's indigenous folks all, really all over this world that just don't get recognized. And they they... It's, it's a world, it's, it's not just a local view here in the United States, it's a world view. And they're trying to uh, challenge our understanding of how we, how, how our relationship, how our personal and at large relationship is with land. Land is a curriculum because what we learn on this land is what we inevitably do to this land, right? All right. So that's that overview on colonialism. So again, colonialism specifically is a distinct type of colonialism. So again, it's kind of like a different way. It has worked, as I said, across the world, places like Argentina to, to Kenya. Um, and yeah, um, it, 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 it changes the global politics, right? As well as the local politics. Welcome to Postcolonial Space, I'm Masood Raja, and in this video I will briefly explain the term settler colonialism. Now the term settler colonialism is used always in opposition to a different form of colonialism, and most theorists div divide colonialism into occupational colonialism and settler colonialism. Now the occupational or occupied invas invasive colonialism was when Europeans invaded a country, Nigeria, appropriated its resources, took it over, and then left after decolonization. Settler colonialism uh, When you mute, it mutes the video and then settled in that territory. A settler colonialism are overpowered them and then settled in that territory. A settler colonialism develops its own strategies of control, survival, and decimation of the local populations. And it's always important to make this, this distinction in his famous book, The Colonizer and the Colonized, Albert Memmi actually talks about this constituency whose loyalties are usually always with the European mother country and never really transform into loyalties for the native cultures. Now, some example of settler colonialism that was eventually Ousted, uh, the greatest example is Algeria, where the French settlers had huge claims. They claimed to be Algerian, never really mixing with the Arab population, but to a, their claim to being Algerian was so strong that Algeria was never really considered a colony, but as part of the French territory. Now, other open examples, of course, are Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, all of these are settler colonies where the European settlers came, established themselves, and in most cases, either isolated the native population or wiped out the native population and hence developed their own distinct cultures. And this distinction between settler colonialism and occupational colonialism is really important in post-colonial studies because that then allows us to read power into literary production 
from formerly colonized countries, right? So that way we don't make the mistake of conflating the literature produced in United States and Canada and Australia as somehow being post-colonial because it is naturally being produced by European settlers who took the land and isolated the people. Now, the early theorists of post-colonial studies whose works a lot of people cite, especially from Pakistan and India, like people like Bill Ashcroft and others, in their uh, famous 1996 book, uh, which was called... Oh, what did I do? Oh, no. mistake of conflating the literature produced in United States and Canada and Australia as somehow being post-colonial because it... He's making a good point here. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. So the point that I want y'all to understand is literature, as particularly as it relates to settler colonialism or a lot of... I'm not even going to just say... This, this can happen in a lot of ways, but sometimes it happens a lot with conversation as it relates to racism and settler colonialism. Sometimes decolonization comes from the perspective of the colonializer. It's kind of like you hear, have you heard like a lot of Black Panther Party members say you can't use the master's tools to break down the master's house? Kind of like that. It's naturally being produced by European settlers who took the land and isolated the people. Now, the early theorists of post-colonial studies whose works a lot of people cite, especially from Pakistan and India, like people like Bill Ashcroft and others in their and literature of Australia and New Zealand, their venture in the beginning, I was then launching Pakistani art and it is now an established journal. A lot of uh, settler colonialism can be helpful in studying the lives of the Native American people and, and what happens to them because of settler activity in the past, but also even in the present, what happens to their lands, what happens to their cultures. Similarly, we can apply the concept of settler colonialism within the post colonies themselves. I mean, if you look at India, there is a dominant group on a national level and on regional level and against those are the rights of the Adivasis, the rights of Dalits and how does that divide work? Also within India, the divide between the Darwinian Hindus in the South and so-called Aryan Hindus from the North. Who, and then of course the settlements by Muslims and how it, so settler colonialism is a distinct term and that Historically, it was the kind of colonialism where the European settlers actually went, captured territory, developed their own subcultures there, and became the dominant groups in those countries. And in the current glo global order, you can also take a look at the settler colonialism in Africa. For example, in South Africa, despite the fact that the apartheid was defeated, apartheid itself was a system implemented by the settlers, by the European settlers to keep the majority Africans isolated. But even after in the post-apartheid world, most of the resources of the nation, its wealth is still owned by the settlers, right? Who also consider that themselves South Africans, but they, their alliances, their affiliations are still with Europe. Similarly, another stark example of when someone tried to undo the privilege of settler colonists is the example of Zimbabwe, right? Where, you know, the Zimbabwean government tried to- Okay, he, we can go on and on about examples. You also have India, um, which was dominated by the British. That's another example. Of course, you see Australia that was um, undertaken, the Aborigines and the Native folks there were undertaken by the British as well. Um, and of course, if you think about Europe, right? A lot of y'all may not know about the Berlin Conference that happened in like the 1700s, but the Berlin Conference was a conference that was held in Berlin um, and it was, con it was conducted by all of Europe 
to literally go around the world and colonize it. Like they had a plan on colonizing it. And they knew that they would create different subcultural plans in different areas. They knew that the way that they colonized in Africa would not be the same way that they colonized in the Americas. And it couldn't be the same way that they colonized. They also went to Asia. The British were in Beijing and in China for a long time. You also have another example of this, the French. I think the French are the worst. The French and the Portuguese are probably the worst because again, you look at the Portuguese and the Dutch who were in South Africa, as he was, as he was talking about, which the apartheid was during my time. I, I think the part time ended in like the 90s, right before, right before President Obama, it's like crazy. And you've seen when there was, that was when the first, the, that's when the world had its first two world leaders as blows Black people in two major countries like South Africa and the United States at one time, two Black presidents. Of course, we've seen presidents in other lands. Um, you always going to see a Black president in, in Ghana, right? Because it's nothing but Black people, but particularly where there's a lot of settler colonialism like South Africa or the United States, you, you don't see all of our presidents were not looking like the people native of their of the land because of the activity and the cultural and political and economic activity that had changed the landscape of what it looked like in the United States and also what it looked like in South, in South Africa. So there's many examples of settler colonialism. We're just gonna keep on rolling along. Climate um, and how does this relate to climate? So. More than 6.3 million hectares of Australian bush, forest and national park have burned in what's been called the worst wildfires in the country's history. The megafires have claimed the lives of 24 people, including three volunteer firefighters, over half a billion animals, and killed off the chances of Prime Minister Scott Morrison of ever looking like a decent human being again in his natural living days. Nah, you're an idiot, Michael. You really are. Forget about that whole global warming malarkey for a second. The deputy prime minister suggested that exploding horse manure was behind the devastating wildfires. While respected journalists like Donald Trump's large adult fail son, Donald Trump Jr., have touted the theory that nefarious arsonists are to blame for the catastrophe. Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, the largest media corporation in Australia, responsible for 58%. Oh. Keep doing this. Sorry. More than six point three million hectares of Australian bush. Large adult fail son Donald Trump Jr. have touted the theory that nefarious arsonists are to blame for the catastrophe. Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, the largest media corporation in Australia, responsible for 58% of the country's newspaper circulation, has been at the heart of a disinformation campaign. It's been claimed that the fires which have burned more of New South Wales than the previous 15 years of bushfires combined are nothing to be worried about and are no worse than the marshmallow melters of the past. And they all lie. the while conspiracy theories on WhatsApp and Facebook have flourished, pinning the blame on greenies for blocking prescribed burning, which is A, bollocks, and B, bollocks. Oh, and maybe Muslims are behind it all anyway. <laughs> There's big money to be made by watching the world burn. Some men just want to watch the world burn. The five biggest publicly owned oil and gas companies spent over $200 million last year lobbying to block, control, delay and derail climate policy. In the US alone, fossil fuel interests have outspent environmental groups in lobbying by a ratio of 10 to 1. And Australia is not much different. Despite being one of the most vulnerable developed countries to climate change, as the world's largest exporter of coal and liquefied gas, <coughs> successive governments have worked tirelessly to water down international climate agreements that might have otherwise interfered with the fossil fuel industry. While its domestic emissions are fairly low, those from Australia's carbon exports are among the world's largest. The beleaguered PM Scott Morrison, who tragically had to cut his Christmas holly bobs in Hawaii short because, like, his country was on fire, literally owes his entire premiership to fossil fuel money. Clive Palmer, a coal mining magnate, set up a political party which delivered Scott Morrison's Liberals a narrow election win last year by peeling... 
I don't want to go too much into Australia's political corruption and coercion, but <laughs> but a lot of this also happens again. Like you like uh, you know we have lobbyists, right? And same type of conservative as she says specifically. I think in the U.S. it's ten to one, then the money numbers just to be able to be be able to compete. And, and just because you have the money doesn't mean you're always competing at that same level to be able to, again, like I said about racism in terms of you need to be able to have the same amount because if racism works at 10 to counter racism, you're gonna have to work at 10. It's the same way as it relates to this climate issue, right? If, if the climate issue is being made pervasive to this extent, then we need to deal with that resolution with that same type of, urgency and with that same type of extent. So here's some authors that talk about, um, these are some of the ones that, these are some, just some of the ones that I know. Um, one of the ones I wanna point out the most important and that changed my life, I was actually able to watch him speak. Well, I was actually able to see two of these people's, well, one of them is my Facebook friend, but we're not gonna get into that later. But, um, Bell Hooks is someone who talks about environmental issues, and she also talks about the intersection of racism, sexism, classism, and she's a very poetic woman that talks very easily about these things, so I would suggest you um, read in, like, Talking Back. That's a good book, especially for you, Ella, at an early age. As a woman, it was very important for me, and it's, again, small B-E-L, so when you type it, don't hyphenate, because that's something she, like, how Beyonce made sure that that apostrophe was in the E of her name. It's the same thing with Bell Hook. She makes sure like when you look for her, it's not capitalized. So it's underscore B-E-L-L -L hooks. And she does that for, when you read about her, she does that for reasons of colonialism. So she does talk about colonialism too, from a woman's perspective. And she also talks about love and her conversations about love and how women of color are not loved in the workspace and stuff like that. How that's uh, a reason because when, uh, of uh, be, us being taught through colonialism. So you should definitely check her out. Frank B. Wilderson, actually, I have one of his books right here. He's actually one of my Facebook friends. I talked to him from time to time. He wrote this book called um, Black Pessimism. This one, he's, um, he's um, you'll hear Black pessimism, pessimism a lot in your debate careers. Um, and I mean, it kind of, it kind of, it's in the name what the criticism is. Black people have a reason to be pessimist. Why, why shouldn't, why shouldn't we? Like, we're probably, the, in terms of particularly Black, and I, let me be specific, because Black is, you have Black people in Spain, you have Black French, you have Black French in Haiti, you have um, Black um, Indians in Gaia, Gaia, you have all types of Blacks, right? Um, but specifically with Black Americans, we there's this thing where we don't have a tie to our natural, our, our, our like native and linguistic cultures and our food ties. And so he talks about the reason why we have the right to be pessimistic about that, like reasons why we need our reparations and stuff like that. He supports all of those types of like claims of pessimism. Ivan Van Sertum is also important. I got to see him speak when I was 14. Um, I wish that I never used him when I was a debater, but I think he's someone that should be used as a debater a lot more because he's an anthropologist. He talks about how specifically there's this conversation about civil society and understanding worldview. Colonialism is about understanding and it's also about understanding the world. It could be understanding your local world or your global world, whatever, but it's about understanding the world is what colonialism does. And it, 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 it intends to do that because again, it's about taking people from their natural understanding, right? So of course it's going to soak up everything and replace something new. So I haven't been certain it talks about how before there was this understanding of only white people or Europeans being civilized, there's literal artifacts and proof. Well, I mean, we know this. We know this because every black invention, half the shit we wouldn't have in the modern world, it wouldn't be the phone, the personal computer, traffic lights. I mean, I could write lists of the things we invented. Michael Jackson, my, for God's sakes. But I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna get off my, my, my soapbox. <laughs> but, but yes, he's an anthrop anthropologist that talks about like our understandings of time and our understandings of like understanding what it means to be, um, 
cognizant of the, of the civil society and the civil world, what it means to be a part of the civil world and how uh, there was known technology. I mean, how else did black and brown people get to America, right? We got here on boats as well. It wasn't Christopher Columbus who sailed the seas first. That's a, that's a lie. So he talks about actual people who sailed the seas before Christopher Columbus and he has actual anthropo he has a, a perspective from anthropologic point of view. Well, Tim Wise, you, go ahead. What do you mean by um they call it people who sailed before just like in general, just like sea travel? Like what yes, like Europe was not the first to make it to the Americas. Oh, okay. Who was? Black folks. That's why you found black people here. When he got here, there was brown people here, which means they got here via boats. I see. Right. Right. So again, for, for example, let me give more insight into this. So when people were being held captive in slavery, whether that be from, because there was also, slavery wasn't just happening in Africa, it was also happening in some of the Arabic countries as well as Asia. But particularly, they focused on Africa. But here nor there, um, the thing about the th what was I saying you were asking about? Um, so the thing about some of the times that people were being captured and they would go out to sail to make it to the Americas, some of those boats would be, uh, there would be riots. The same way that there's riots in our cities, there would be riots on the boats. You, and back in those days, it took some time before you get to the United States. So a lot of these slaves who would, you know, scrub the decks or whatever, be as servants who are allowed to be unbonded or whatever without chains, right? Those, they would work and they would work out plans to be able to escape. But you're, you're, on, you're out on sea and these are times, you, there wasn't no cell phones, none of that back at those times. So, um, okay, no problem. So I'm gonna, hold on one second, y'all. I'm gonna bring in Nathaniel, sorry. So yeah, so 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 there's this idea that Christopher, well, it's not, and it just just first of all, Christopher Columbus was not the first colonialist, nor was he the first person to travel the seas, right? So that's what Ivan Van Sederman talks about from the anthropologist's perspective, but he uses actual artifacts and, and actual anthropology to prove his point. Right. Okay. So but in terms of um we call it like the eastern hemisphere reaching the western hemisphere or the other way around. Yes. Yes, even Asia, first of all, the first, in terms of, from, a, from at least this is from what I know as an anthropologist, from what, from my readings of anthropology, the first civilizations to really be at large in terms of, I don't know, and this, I don't know, who knows who was before them, but, <laughs> you know, who really knows who was first, it's like the chicken or the egg, but there is anthropology that creates more sensibilities for African and Asian folks because there is a lot of anthropological evidence that those were actually the first, you know, Chinese dynasty. That was actually the first world trade market was between China and Africa. People don't know that. When China gave, I think, I think, or no, I'm sorry, some African ruler gave China giraffes because when Ch Chinese migration would come into Africa and they would be like, oh, you know, there's these folks here. And there's this conversation that starts between Africa. So even if you think about Egypt, like even that understanding of Egypt was like way after a lot of other global things have occurred. So he actually points out some timelines again so that people can get their 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 understanding of history correct and to also his objective is also through his understandings of anthropology to create some understandings of decolonization right okay tim wise i like tim wise because he's like probably the best white guy that talks about racism um so he's good at the talk he talks and he talks about it from a perspective that's white and who needs to be more understanding of his privilege, which doesn't happen. So that's why I like to use him a lot. For those people who, like, again, like that 
God, we watched in that video that says that a lot of people um, come from, a lot of people try to say that they are coming from or have the attention of decolonization, but they're still using the tools of decolonization. Um, and he he's good with stuff like that. Nicole Wilson, I'm not too familiar with her, but um, I know from from my research, she was someone who came up a lot. Alex Cox is someone who came up a lot. I'm not familiar with them. Um, Charles Mills is someone who passed away a few years ago. He's someone that talks a lot about um, um, colonization. Patrick Wolf is actually in the evidence, but I found out that he actually writes more stuff about colonization. Bird is within the evidence, but he's also someone who writes more. King should also be within the evidence, and there's more. Um, Bell Court might be in the evidence, don't remember. Ortiz might be within the evidence, but they also write more. Oh, I don't know if you want to um, follow along with this here, Nate, Nathaniel. Um, I'm just going over settler colonialism. Okay. Um, some of this stuff might be useful you, for you too. We didn't talk about too much. We just talked about the premises because I know you talked about settler colonialism last year, right? Yeah, that was the thing. Yeah. Okay, 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 okay. We can just talk about a little bit more how and how it's specifically racist uh, this year. Um, we just watched a video prior that talks about how like, you know, um, government and corporate initiatives is what push, you know, um, those colonialist views and continues to create like these climate issues because it's only, you know, these lobbyists and these conservative or, you know, people who are part of these conservative, what do you call it? Um, conservationist programs are not able to do their jobs because they're fighting against, you know, these these big, big industries and these, and you know, again, it's about regulations and loopholes and stuff like that. Okay, so things to know. Colonialism is an activity. It's not based on skin color. So um, black people can be colonialists. That does not mean I'm saying black people can be racist, which is different. That's a different type of um, conversation or, um, or, or whatever. A different scenario. That's a different scenario. Anybody can be a colonialist. Um, and colonialism can work in different ways again. Um, but, you know, historically, you know, you've never seen an African country be like, hey, let's gather around and let's figure out how we can eradicate the white folks. Black people have never done that. Neither has Asia. But again, you have examples of Ber Berlin um, Conference, which was a global and was meant to last centuries. And it did, hence why you had um, pervasive structures like Jim Crow or lynching, which is again, those, uh, the several different waves or layers of how uh, settler colonialism worked. Um, how did U.S. Uh, so so some of the criticisms you might hear in debate again is black pessimism or give back the land, which are run by typically folks who represent that community. Um, I've run black pessimism. I've also run not necessarily give back the land, give back the land in specific, but arguments related to give back the land. Um, I've run arguments like that. Some people who are not from that again, you can run this argument and not be from that group. You can still make the criticism because it's again, it's a world view and it's an action based on those world views. And that's what colonialism is intended to do. That's why it's hard to be like, hey, you know, that's why, you know, the people who be like, hey, I'm not racist, they get away with it. And then there's people who get called racist. It's like, dang, that's not even the real racism. We had some real stuff going on. How did the US le gain legitimacy? You know, we need to talk about the legitimacy of the US. Yes. What does it mean? Like when people talk about like, oh, the U.S. can do this and do that and do that, but how? How did it even get to be able to do those things and to quote unquote have the intentions to fix those problems? Um, and you might want to write this down. Um, these two words, especially when it relates to critiques, the word ontology that's spelled O N T O L O G Y, ontology. The other word is pedagogy. Uh, you should probably write down pedagogy before ontology. It's P. Let me, am I writing it right? right so am I, saying, I know I spelled ontology right. O N T O L O G Y. Yes, ontology. Pedagogy. P E D A G O G Y. It's pedagogy. The other word you're going to need to know is a priori. It's, it's a Latin word. It's a space priori. 
P R I O R I. Because those words have different functions in terms of conceptualizing about how we get to where we are within the status quo and how do we get to understanding like again how did the United States gain its legitimacy and you using ontology which is like how it's the understanding of no of how do we become that's what ontology means pedagogy means um learning from folks it is um a lesson and it's not a lesson as a as a student or as a teacher, but it's an experience lesson, right? That you're not coming from an ivory tower perspective. That's what pedagogy is. Wait, sorry, could you say that again? Pedagogy is like not coming from an ivory tower perspective. Pedagogy is a way of learning that is almost like you're the student and the teacher almost, but not really, it's kind of like a, um, an, uh, a way of learning, it's a way of learning through experience almost, of kind of being like that constant student, but also that student that acts from like that lesson you learn from your teacher or from the world, if the world is your teacher. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's again, a word that's kind of philosophical. <laughs> a priori is Latin, it's just, uh, it's kind of like status quo. A priori just means that this conversation comes first. It's like the priority. Um, it's like before we can think about your laws or think about federal government action, you have to think about how you can make conclusions of how we understand policymaking. I done messed up my hat here. Oh my Lord Jesus. What's going on? child um how does the u.s maintain its legitimacy how does it not only how does it gain it but how does it maintain it which is the difference between colonialism and settler colonialism western expansion versus colonialization right what are the effects of colonialism um are those results bad who knows maybe colonialism is good impact impact turn that <laughs> i don't know <laughs> well, I, well, I do know. I, I, from my opinion, colonialism is bad. But go ahead. Someone had a question. Question? Anybody? Sam? Was that you? No. Okay. I was just saying. It seems like it's pretty tough to um, <laughs> no. spin that. No, it's just that this is probably the most topical link in a long time for a critique because a lot of times people run capitalism and capitalism i just know link term i mean not no link term Ooh, excuse me i know links a lot of cap k's and stuff like that because a lot of a lot of times this is probably just one of those k's that just happened to really fit the topic this year and also like how is that colonialism implicated like what are the effects of the colonialism that's existing how is it manifested in today's world you need to be able to um especially when you're running this critique have some like examples and explanation of some of these questions in your storytelling. Keywords. Oh, I already I didn't even know about this. Um, ontology, land. You want to be be careful how you're using these words, how you come to understand these words of consumption, abundance. Are you coming from the, the mindset of a colonialist, a settler, or a native? And you kind of have to sometimes take the perspective of someone else if or maybe challenge yourself it doesn't mean it, again this is a mindset thing like i have been sexist sometimes in my life i have been sometimes anti-black in my life and i'm a black person i've sometimes done some anti-black activities okay it ha i mean not to say it happens it's just like it but you learn to do better right and so that's why you must engage in pedagogies that are actively trying to challenge the per the 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 pervasiveness that is, you know, bad or negative. Understanding borders and national lines, how you rectify those situations when you're talking about them within debate, how you rectify civil society, modernity, you know, or talking about progress as well, or even talking about the word, using the words degrowth or growth could set a link off in those debates. Using the words like indigenous and settler, right? Because those things are codifying, as I said earlier. And also sewing within that triad, right? You're literally creating that triad all over again. And, and it's not just, it's also to, it's about the rhetoric, it's about your performance, it's about your representations. All of those things can become a link. 
this is why I love critiques. Sorry. Um, so when you're thinking about alternatives, you can do the reject. Please, please, if you're ever just, if you're getting coached by me, you're never running reject, ever. <laughs> but reject is not an alternative. But some people use rejection as an alternative. I don't know what rejection does. You can reject all day, but as I said about how the status quo works or how a lot, even sex, sexism, right? Sexism is very pervasive. This world is very paternalistic, right? So like, how is rejection going to be an alternative if it's very pervasive? Me as a judge, that don't work. <laughs> like, you're not winning debates here. Some judges like to go for that. That's them, not me. But um Again, this is all about understanding your judge and understanding your audience and understanding also who you're debating against, because maybe that's all you need to do. Maybe a team is not good enough to handle alternative and you can just um, run your link scenarios as case turns. You know, I don't know. Black queerness. I've done this in college. Um, I, I coached the, actually one of the teams. I actually I actually coached a team to end up winning the TLC tournament. So, yes, I've coached a team that won the TLC tournament. So just know I can have it can happen. I'm pretty good. Um, so yeah, um, they have run, um, it wasn't black queerness, it was just queerness because they were white guys. But um, yes, you can do the black, the queerness or, or together. <laughs> um, black rage is another one. There's guerrilla warfare is another alternative. Decolonization is a, a warfare. Um, having the pedag pedagogy of the oppressed is another alternative. Um, I don't know. There's so many, there's, there's, there's so many philosophical alternatives. I'm not a philosopher. This, that's one of those moments I pick up a book and find one. Um, when you say alternative, like, what do you mean by that? So in this, this, a critique is kind of like a diss set functionally. It's kind of like a counter plan and a diss set at the same time, because there's no uniqueness. There's no uniqueness to, uh, there's no uniqueness to a critique. There's just link impact like a diss set but there's an alternative kind of like a critique there's some competitive competitive I'm trying to say the word competitiveness the same way like a counter plan has competitive competitiveness that you can perm so does a critique because you're criticizing the assumptions the underlying assumptions whether that is rhetorical whether that's performative whether that is somebody did something crazy before the round started whether that is there was some abuse in the debate round when you ask him a simple question about something and he called you a B-I-T-C-H and you run a sexism argument, whatever, because people sometimes are crazy, okay? You know what I mean? And I had to say it, but, oh, Sam, I, I sent you that thing about Trump and the judge wrote the thing <laughs> on the ballot. Yes! Yeah, crazy. Oh I was literally scrolling through my timeline and I was, one of my, one of my friends, she, she whooped my butt when, she, when we were debaters, but one of my friends who's like kind of one of my heroes in debate, I was scrolling and she really helped me like with my conversation about like sexism and stuff like that. Cause I'm like, you know, you know, I was like black power, black power. She was like, did you ever think about the black women in your community? And I was like, oh, you're right. That was the first moment in debate where I lost that debate. But anyways, I was reading her page cause I'm always interested in the stuff that she's like criticizing. And she was like, and I was thinking like, who does this to, first of all, these are children. like. Who cares about your political views, sir? Anyways, but again, people are great. Like, as you can see, Sam, people in this activity are crazy. And as I've, I don't know if I've told you, Sam, but I've had some messed up interactions. And most of my interactions have not been messed up with students. It's been like coaches because they care to make their kids win so much. They will say and do crazy stuff and antagonize their kids to do crazy and cool stuff because they may be, I, I I mean maybe I wasn't not I wasn't cognizant of it, or maybe I was naive. They didn't want a black little kid to win from Kansas City, probably. So that was probably the case. Well, it didn't work most of the time. So shame on <laughs> it. But yeah, um, does that make you understand it? Like your question, the answer to your question, like out there in a critique, you have an alternative to be able to change the dynamics of how the underlying assumptions work within the status quo of the world. All right. Yeah, that makes sense. Because again, it's like the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation did not say it solved racism. <laughs> and it didn't also solve slavery. It took years before there was actually enforcement and actual protocols to like eradicate slavery. And even still to this day in 2021, sharecropping still exists. So technically slavery still has not ended. 
I'm sorry, 2022. Yes, you're looking at me like, Ella, yes, shirt cropping still exists in the South. Isn't that crazy? In 2022. You would think with all the marching and, and Trayvon Martin and stuff going on, it's like, which I don't have Fox 4 in the South? What's happening? Jesus Christ. But it's true. It's really, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to go down there like Harriet Tubman and bring some people to the North. I don't know. <laughs> and I'm not trying to laugh because it's a serious situation, but it's like, that's how pervasive things are. But yeah, like, that's why there's not, that's why people suggest alternatives because policymaking sometimes isn't enough. And sometimes we need to have this. That's why using some type of framing or using like some new way of challenging your, um, your assumptions, like, you know, trying to define the ontology, or redefine the ontology, or again, like understanding, it's kind of like, you know, you have to take this new approach when you move forward, basically, you keep, because you keep making the same mistakes. And so like, you know, the reason why the United States can't get it right is because we still can't get it right. You know, there's, you know, there's been this huge inherent detriment to Black people and how um, they are able to exist within the United States. And so it creates the, it's going to continue to, we're not going to be able to, again, it's not to be fixed overnight. You know what I mean? So how do we create some real strides kind of what the alternative is, is evoking? Do you know, if for, what do you call it, back to the alternative, so, like the alternative um, proposed for settler colonialism, that would just be the like decolonial. You can do whatever. I don't know. You want that's one of them. Those are just an example of a few that I was thinking of. And those, those are not. I, I mean, if it was me, I mean, me. I did a towards the end of my year. I did a lot of nihilist alternatives. A lot of kind of. I did opacity. So that was that's me. Um, I did. I didn't really do. A, and I did a lot of like very aggravated angry stuff like black rage and stuff and a lot of performative stuff so for me de decolonization would work that's too soft for me <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> that's for me other people that works i don't know it's about what you like and what you like to argue philosophically too what philosophical perspective can you add conversation to because again you you have to come from a different perspective to challenge those assumptions right yeah so this is a card. I don't even know why I put it here in this slide, but it's there. I don't know. I forgot why it's here. We can, obviously, I guess we can read it. The plan um, is create schemes that expand colonial water and undermine the genuine sovereignty. So through the sovereignty, again, talking about sovereignty, what does sovereignty mean? That's probably another word you need to try to understand. And I, as a debater, you probably should be careful with this word because so sovereignty, sovereignty could also be codifying and understanding that triad between, what it was the triad that said? The settler native slave triad, right? So um, to try not to be in that triad you might want to be careful how you use the word sovereignty as well, because it, again, continues to create that. The, the word I would use in debate isn't triad. The word I use, I used in debate was dichotomy or hierarchy, which are two other words that you can use. Dichotomy is um, when, you, when you say something that creates a juxtaposition to something, right? You otherizing, right? Where if you say, oh, I'm white, then there has to be something other than white, right? So those things can also get you in trouble because they're codifying. So like, again, indigenous peoples, like what does it mean to be indigenous? Like even the people that's here wasn't always here, right? Like black people came from somewhere else too. Like when, when Christopher Columbus got here, those people that was here wasn't always here either. You know what I'm saying? People move. There's always been human migration. Like that's what people don't seem to understand. Again and again, it's, it's, it's talking about seeking to codify indigenous legal traditions. Um, and when they're talking about um, codifying indigenous legal traditions, that juxtaposes what's not um, um, indigenous in terms of what is American sovereignty and, and, and in terms of American um, legal tradition. So yeah, I think this card is pretty good in terms of giving an example of like linking or having a general link um, to settler colonialism, I think it's an is an this is an extension, um, because it was probably the best extension link I found within the file, which I should do as a note, 
um, since y'all have had this kind of jump start to this conversation of settler colonialism, I um, also I just do know that I have some additional cards that you can supplement for that file. Um, I could probably get that out to you, but you need to grapple with the initial cards first. Um, and I'll see if I can work with Jonah and my team to get that uh, published for you all. The other thing- um, to Just to be clear, we can read critique cards, right? Well, you, if you're going to Berkeley, heck yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just maybe at Berkeley, yes, you can run critiques also too. Um, um, but no, um, to answer your question, Sam, for the next February tournament, no, if you plan on staying in the novice division at the next tournament for the Aaron Thomas Memorial, you would have to, you know, just say that for another time. Mm -hmm.